Brian Smith, publisher for Inside the Nights on Fan Nation, powered by Sports Illustrated. And today is a discussion about conference realignment, how it is impacting different conferences in the Power Five, as well as programs in the Group of Five. This is mostly about the conferences trying to battle one another in the so-called pact that three of the conferences are going to align themselves with in an effort to keep out another conference. So what is really going on? That's what everybody wants to know. I'm going to give my take on it. And quite frankly, I think it's a brilliant thought process for three of these conferences. And I think it will lead to a lot of moving around and even more than what I had originally thought. And that's why you always have to be kind of careful with you know how much you project and how many things you think are going to transpire. But with that being stated, here's the number one thing to look at. There's not going to be just one super conference dominating college football. As much as SEC fans think so, false. That's not going to happen. Number two, there's going to be a multiple, multiple level of teams going across conferences to schedule. This will also impact the opportunity for a few teams at least and this is very, very preliminary, to jump up and go into Power 5. There are going to be conferences that are going to get bigger. There are going to be conferences that get smaller. It's just moving pieces or chess pieces. So let's start off with the first part of this. Number one, anytime conference realignment comes into this, and I, I hate having to talk about this, but it's, it's what it's about, it's money. There's no other way around it. It's money. You can say that 500 times and it's still not enough because there isn't a second place. They can say whatever they want from the Big 12 or the SEC or any, you know, whatever group is talking about realignment, it's money. The people that get up there that are athletic directors that like the SEC was talking about at the Texas or, you know, border regions and all. Oh, it's good for the, no, it's about money. They are lying. Period. End of story. They are lying. That's first. Number two, we're going to be looking at the scheduling matchups and how they can kind of help money for teams that are not going to be in the SEC because with Oklahoma and Texas, obviously joining that league, that gives them a lot of leverage with television. Obviously, there's been a lot of consternation with the Big 12 and ESPN. Uh, that's probably going to be a very ugly thing for a very long time. and It'll cause a lot of backdoor problems in terms of these conferences working out bowl games, et cetera. ESPN probably did some things they shouldn't. That's that's what the Big 12 is saying. ESPN is saying, oh, not us. That's another whole article, but we'll get into that at another time. But the matchups that can be created from all this are a blast. And that's what I wrote about yesterday on Inside the Nights. You could have Clemson play in Oregon. You could have Wisconsin going down to Florida State. You could have Washington going to Miami. You could have Miami going out to UCLA. There are a lot of different things going on. The three conferences with this pact are Pac-12, Big Ten, ACC, and they just had ADs talking with each other. How can we do something that's a little bit different than what the SEC is doing? The SEC is doing the traditional thing. They're adding teams to a league. It's not, not anything new. However, here's the new concept that you should really understand. If you still schedule as if you're a league and you're three leagues, I mean, that's a massive amount of teams. Then there's a really good chance that you're going to have an advantage over the so-called super conference that the Southeastern conference is trying to develop and quote unquote, dominate college football with this concept. It's immediately going to jump ahead and create matchups that money. Here's that word again. will be involved with TV is about the following which markets are or are not involved in this game. That's what they look at. That's what these people from behind the scenes look at. And a lot of college football fans need to wake up to how this works. It's not about what's good for the team. It's not about what it's good for the players. It's about how do TVs make money? Because without that, if advertisers, when I say TV, it's really advertisers. If advertisers are not happy, your game doesn't get put into a prime spot. You do not make as much money. You do not pay your bills as an athletic department. And I'll get into that in a second. It's another touchy part that's an extended part of money. But again, go back to those matchups. Think about all the teams in the Pac-12. That's a market that is very unique because you have L.A., 
San Francisco, Seattle, Portland. You have Phoenix, which is a really growing market. You have San Diego, San Jose. You have Utah, which is Salt Lake City. Denver, University of Colorado is on the west edge of Denver. That's a big market. These are opportunities for those schools to take their, bri their brand and move it across the country. And, you know, you play Michigan in the big house. That's obviously a big attraction. If you're Colorado and you go play Florida State, that's a big attraction. You, you're merging markets. Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa all would have the Florida State game. The Atlanta market would be brought in. You're crossing. Advertisers love that. Most fans probably don't care about that, but that's what pushes the buttons to make the games happen. Fair or not, that will never change. Money, money, money. You cannot say it enough times. With the scheduling matchups that they're talking about here, potentially, the big dog in this is Clemson, at least for now, because they're such a dominant program in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Out of the three leagues, they're the one that's kind of unique because for those of you that don't know, Clemson's in the middle of nowhere in South Carolina. I mean, just literally cow fields. But they get the Atlanta market and they get the Charlotte market. You're going to get Jacksonville involved. It's kind of a cross-reference of areas. That's very unique, but their brand is national right now because they've had so many great quarterbacks, especially Trevor Lawrence just recently being a player that goes number one in the draft, et cetera. They've won a national title two times. That team is something that we'll need to see how much they're willing to schedule some of these interconference kind of deals. I highly doubt Dabble really wants to change what they're doing with their out-of-conference scheduling. So that's the one potential snafu. Why would he want to change anything? They're winning. I, I get it. Why am I going to USC to potentially lose a game when I can play some cupcake and then go into the ACC with teams that can't beat me? That's just true. He's never going to admit that. But I mean, I'm sure – that's how I would look at it. If I was him, why would he? So the scheduling still has a few things to iron out, and this is all preliminary, but the matchups that you could create are fantastic. They're fantastic. Ohio State playing at Clemson. Yeah, I'm going to watch that game. I'm going to watch that game. Ohio State playing at Miami. Yeah, I'm going to watch that game. Wisconsin. Let's go there. Let's go down and let's, let, you know what, let's, let's do something different. Let's play at Arizona State. Michigan State, let's go to USC. Cross-country rivalries are very rare. The only one that is played every year is Notre Dame and USC. That's of any consequence. That's it. Teams don't want to do it because it's cost a lot of money. So it's not going to happen with the same team every year. It does cost more. But if you get more money in return from, the, again, the advertisers slash television, then it's worth it. The logistics have to be worked out. Which network or networks would do it? I have no idea before anybody asks. I want to know too. But something tells me that ESPN won't be as involved with it. I would expect with the Pac-12's allegiance with Fox Sports and Big Ten could be a part of that. There could be Big Ten network games that carry some of this. There's going to be crossover. CBS could be involved with it. It's hard to say. And for those of you that don't know, ESPN and ABC – are all under the Walt Disney World umbrella. So ABC may not be as likely as before. We'll see. It depends on how much the little war that goes on with the Big 12 and how much that bubbles in and out of the Big 12. It could reach some of the other conferences as well if they think they're giving special treatment to the SEC. This, this is just the tip of the iceberg with that. And it's a very big fly in the ointment. ESPN is a big part of college football. It's the biggest part from a major markets and everybody watching college game day. I mean, I love that show too. It's fun. It's fun to watch it. But once you think that teams are getting an advantage, don't think that the big 12 commissioner isn't discussing what he thinks and people within that league think that ESPN did or is con continuing to do whatever it may be. I have no idea to promote Oklahoma and Texas coming in because for those that don't know, ESPN also owns the SEC network. Yes, they gain an advantage. Yes, they gain money with Oklahoma and Texas. Pretty easy to build the argument that they were hammering on the Big 12, collapsing and all that over and over again. And there were a lot of articles and a lot of their people talking about it. So that's probably not going to help them in the long term. That's never going to go away. You can't pull that back in. You've already made that throw. That rock went through the window. ESPN is going to get hammered forever. Not going to stop. 
So how does that get mended? Can it? I don't know. But that, that's my one concern with this because we, we need all the networks to work in unison, not just two or three, all of them. So I want to see the UCLA at, you know, Georgia Tech game, and I want to see Clemson at Ohio State, et cetera. We need all those networks to work. The final part of this, before I go into any further, is if the Big 12 loses those two schools, and again, it's it's all, all done, basically, just more signatures, Oklahoma, Texas to the SEC, they need more members. The question is how many more? The other part is the Big Ten would love to add Kansas. I don't care what they say publicly. Again, never believe what an AD says publicly about changing leagues and all that. They're going to lie. They would love to add Kansas because of hoops. Basketball program has been good for a very long time. Tradition rich. They sell out. They would add a lot of intrigue to the Big Ten basketball schedule. If you pull Kansas out of the Big 12 and they go to the Big 10, that's three teams you're missing. You got to pull from somewhere else. Is it going to be Pac 12? Is it going to be the American Athletic Conference? Something else? Do they get BYU? That's another, that's a real unique one. I have no idea. BYU might be the most intriguing, but I know very little about how their hierarchy works. You got to remember. That's the Mormon church that kind of operates that institution. How it goes down, I don't know. Um, think of like Notre Dame. Notre Dame runs things differently. Their athletic budget at Notre Dame is exactly the same budget for the entire school. It's all one big pot. Does BYU look at it that way? All these things, again, money matter. So that's a potential school to kind of watch out for because that would be very broad based. Bringing them into the Big 12 would be unique. It's another school in Utah. You would get the Salt Lake market. You would get a little bit like Denver might be involved with that. You would also have some opportunities maybe in Arizona because the Mormon faith is very strong there. Phoenix might carry it. The Big 12 would expand their footprint. Like it or not, that's what this is. How do we get more television sets? The reason you need more television sets is to pay for your athletic budget and because, quite frankly, Title IX. You have to have the same number of male and female scholarships per Title IX, and football is the fly in the ointment there as well. You're 85 to negative every single year because of football. There is no female football team. 85. So that's why there are very few men's sports anymore in Division I colleges, and it's just the way it is. It's, it's not going to go anywhere. The other part of that is it's not even the female sports. It's all sports not named basketball or football. For men, and there's a few exceptions, LSU baseball, uh, maybe University of Connecticut's uh, women's basketball team. There are a few sports that aren't men's basketball or football that are profitable, but they're very rare. You have to make up for all those athletic budget deficits, and they are massive, 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 massive. You need to find a way to do that. Football. You have to find a way to make money on football to the umpteenth degree. It's why you see teams schedule home games against teams. You're like, why would they play them? Butts and seats. They want boosters at their home games as many times as possible to try to get them to donate in butts and seats. End of story. Parking, you're going to get concessions. You're paying $350 for a water or whatever. It's ridiculous. Don't buy anything at these games, by the way. Drink and eat before and after the game. Don't go into the stadium and spend stupid money. It's so dumb. But that's what they're doing. They want butts and seats. And then the television markets, when they can broaden, that's how it happens. So the Big 12, let's think about the AAC, Cincinnati, Memphis. Those would be attractive because they've got good basketball programs traditionally, and their football programs now are also going up. SMU, Dallas market, you cannot get more financially lucrative because of the oil money. Now, other members of the Big, this is very touchy, other members of the Big 12 won't like SMU because they're in Dallas and they worry about recruiting. But that's not how this works. To put it in perspective, Jimbo Fisher was very, very negative about Texas joining the SEC. Well, guess what? He's not the one that voted based on what AM, a member of the SEC, gets to say. It was people above him, Board of Regents, President, etc. You know why they voted Texas in? Guess what? Money period. 
Big 12 thinks they can make more money if SMU is in. They're going to take them. Baylor can be mad, Oklahoma State, whatever school, too bad. That's just how it works. The only decision factor here, money, period. It's not about the student athlete. It's not about tradition. It's not about what the coach says, money. Now, you also have UCF, which is in Orlando. The last I heard that Orlando was the 10th largest market in the country, just in terms of population. That's very attractive. Very attractive. TV and advertising is going to like that. More importantly, it, it's one of the very rare times that a team is in a major market that a conference would like to add from the member standpoint. Baylor likes the idea, well, we'll play UCF once in a while. We're going to be in Florida. Everybody wants to recruit Florida talent. So there is at least a little bit of a bonus for that situation. And Cincinnati is a little bit like that too, because the state of Ohio has a lot of football talent. Basketball, any other sport, both those states, you know, whatever your, your wrestling team, women's swimming, it could be anything. Florida, Ohio, those are big populated states. So it's very helpful to an athletic department in general. If you're going to be traveling there, you might as well recruit there. Your guys are already on these campuses practically or high schools all around UCF or it's high schools all around the University of Cincinnati, Memphis, et cetera. And the same thing with Houston. That's the one in particular, even more so than SMU, that the Big 12 members have never really wanted because of recruiting. Now, UCF and Houston, since they don't draw like Kansas does. That's different. That's state U. I don't care how big UCF is. The following and the allegiance from a state like Kansas, like their people, I have family in that area of the country in Missouri, the following of Kansas basketball is insane. It is cult-like. That's not what any of these schools that I'm talking about here from the AAC have. Like it or not, that's just fact. But they still have a very big market that you can bring in that's unique. A lot of pros and cons for a TV slash advertiser to look at saying, hey, if you go ahead and do this, we'll think about giving you a contract for X number of years for X number of dollars. That's what it's about. And for me, amongst the schools that are realistically looking at it, I'm going to leave BYU out because that's so complex with the religious aspect. Just going to focus on the AAC. This is how I would rank them in terms of serviceability for the people that are the advertisers. Just looking at it from them, and that's, again, the number one thing because it's how the money gets exchanged. The number one team that I would look at would be UCF because of the market being so big in Orlando and the population down here. I live in Florida. It's exploding. Trying to drive in Orlando is a disaster. It's borderline like driving in Washington, D.C. It's horrific. And it's because of the population. It gets bigger every single day. That's more television sets, et cetera. At some point, it wouldn't surprise me if UCF, you know, they, they approached 85, 90,000 students they are over 70 now that believe it's 72 that's something else they look at if they're on tv more these marketers are going to be influenced by the possibility hey their football program is doing really well they've got a coach they're putting investments into it what are we going to do to make them the next team what needs to happen that's backdoor meeting stuff that i'm certainly not involved with but UCF has the opportunity to be the number one, in my opinion, out of the group of five that the Big 12 would want to add. Recruiting, it won't make his coaches as mad. The markets are there for the advertisers, and they're winning in football. It would help if the basketball or the baseball programs were better, et cetera. But they also have Renai Jones, track athlete, who I think eventually will be an Olympian, et cetera. There's a lot of opportunities at UCF. After that, it's kind of – just perspective. Houston, I can understand, but they've been up and down as a football program and they, they really give me pause. I, I don't understand how you cannot be consistently good at Houston. I don't. A few years ago, that city was number two in the country for most NFL players going in or coming out of a city. Miami was one, Houston was two. I mean, they just loaded. Now, I know it's not Big 12 right now. That hurts recruiting a little bit, but Sometimes they're not even 500. I've went over the record a few times in the last few months, and they go up and down like a roller coaster. So if they get the right situation going, though, they added to the Big 12. Houston would be my second pick 
because again, it's a recruiting, it's a massive city. I believe it's the fourth or fifth largest market in the country after LA and New York and Chicago, whatever order that is. I believe they're fourth. It's massive. And the city's adding another belt loop. Like, I mean, it's it's just like two cities combined into one. It is very big. It's very spread out. And that's that's the oil money. You got Exxon Mobil and things like that down there. And the gas and the oil industry power Southeast Texas and parts of Louisiana. That's that's where the jobs are. They create the restaurants and everything else. So that's a city that I think if they can somehow get it to work together would be the number two choice. After that, I say Cincinnati and then Memphis, then SMU in that order. Cincinnati's football program is entrenched, big market. You're going to get the teams that are in the Big 12. If you look at them, they're pretty happy to you know have a team that comes in. It's competitive. And Cincinnati, it's a top 20 football program. What they've done there is quite impressive. I think Cincinnati is a team that is potentially going to be a top 10 program. Because it's it's ironic, even though Ohio State is up right now, they're very good. They're recruiting more nationally. They're only recruiting five to eight kids within their state borders. Outside of occasionally Clemson or Alabama or Notre Dame or something coming in, getting a kid out of Ohio, they really don't lose anybody that they want. That's just truth. Cincinnati is not going to beat Ohio State for recruits that they both recruit just as hard as the other one. When it's apples to apples, they're just not. But Cincinnati doesn't have to do that right now because Ohio State is not going after them, and it's really helping Cincinnati's program. They're getting three, four, five kids more a year out of Ohio that they normally wouldn't get. And Luke Fickle has done – hats off to him. He's he's done a tremendous job there. I, I would be shocked if the Big 12 wouldn't look at them, especially after the Georgia game last year, very competitive in the bowl game. Why would you not think about them? That's a great program. The one that I have the most difficult time talking about is Memphis, and this is why. Memphis is traditionally a basketball school. Penny Hardaway being there, you know, does that work? They've had some issues with off the court with recruiting and stuff that's touchy. I'm not going to get into that. How does that play into it? How does the coaching situation there work? Do they pay enough to keep a big-time staff? That's my only concern. Will the coaches be there and everything to, to win? There's tons of talent in Memphis. That city is loaded. It doesn't matter the sport. It could be track, baseball, basketball, football. You can win at Memphis and in just about any aspect of collegiate athletics. You have the state of Tennessee. You're on the border of Alabama. You're on the border of Arkansas and Kentucky. There's enough players within a 400-mile radius to have a top 20 football recruiting class if you get the right guy there that's truly committed to being the coach of the Tigers. I'm just not sure that's just not a stepping stone job up until this point because nobody wants to stay there, it seems like. Maybe this next guy does. I don't even know the football coach's name. You know why? Because they, they constantly change. You have to prove it to me. That's been a stepping stone job my entire life. Somebody has to be there six, seven years before it matters. That's, that's usually how it works with non-Power 5 schools. To really get the recruiting thing going, same staff, same thing, over and over. Get your system. Usually they're there. Less time than that. And if they are longer, it's because the school doesn't want to buy them out and move them along. Memphis could be a very good football program long term, but like their last coach just went, you know, he's the head coach at Florida State. I get it, but it takes the right guy to want to be there. It's a little bit kind of a, a different city. It's, it's built on music. It's on the river. It's a very poor city. That's a unique situation. But then the last one is SMU. I don't think the Big 12 members will be happy about it. They could be a, an option. We'll see. If Kansas leaves the Big 12, that's where something like SMU could be more of attractive. Does Kansas State leave as well? The state of Kansas and the politics behind this would be involved. That's the one other little fly in the ointment. This is very political because Kansas State, like it or not, they are number two in that state and they always will be. Kansas State fans can send me all the hate emails they want. It's still true. The other part of that is their football program is a gazillion times better than the University of Kansas because they'll take a lot of JUCO kids. They'll take kids that Kansas won't, and they win, and they've had great coaching there. Basketball finds a way to kind of do it that way as well. Maybe the Big Ten would think about adding both, possibly. What about Iowa State? Iowa kind of runs that state, but Iowa State's football program has done very well right, lately. 
They're recruiting down here in Florida quite well. I would imagine that that's another possibility. So how deep does it go into the Big 12, and do they have to pull out of the AAC? The one final point before I wrap up, the reason I'm saying AAC for the Big 12, more so than the Pac-12 or another conference, is this. To pull a team out, let's just use an easy one. Colorado was once a part of the Big 12. They joined the Pac-12 for whatever reason. If you try to absorb them again, again, this is just hypothetical. The contracts, how much money you'd have to pay to get them are pretty high. That's A. And B, even though the Denver market is very desirable for the advertisers and the television, they're not that great at football. They're not that great at basketball. How big a draw are they? And to go through the consternation of getting them, when you can quickly get somebody like Memphis or UCF, Houston, whatever it may be, pick your school, is very, very hard to kind of look at. They need to save face if two or three more of these schools leave. The Big 12 will be swimming with sharks, if you will, once another school leaves. But if two or three, they're not going to have the ability from a leverage standpoint to just completely buy out the contract for Colorado or Arizona or Arizona State BYU, Utah, whatever it may be, that could get ugly. The only way that would work is if they could somehow, and this is just guessing, to get the TV networks to pay part of that in some kind of, you know, closed door meeting. That's possible. I mean, it's it's lawyers and athletic directors and university presidents all getting together. Maybe they can put their heads together and do it. But you're not going to convince me that you can get that done faster and cheaper than getting at least one or two of the AAC teams and or BYU. Just my thought process. Um, the only other thing that really needs to come up with this is that it takes time. This is not a quick process. I get questions constantly from UCF fans. When are we joining the big 12? I have no idea. This is not normally very quick. Think of it as big government in any country you want. Slow. Now, the Texas-Oklahoma thing did expedite the process, but UCF or any other school that is hoping to join the Big 12, that could be within the next two years. That would be my guess because there's going to take another domino. Kansas, in my opinion, is the biggest. But what if Oklahoma State wanted to join the Big 10? What if Oklahoma State wanted to join the Pac-12? I, I just don't see... It doesn't matter which one. Any of the schools outside of Texas in the Big 12, I think, are vulnerable to leave. And I think there's an opportunity once that happens or the fireworks and everything that just going sideways, the Big 10, the Pac-12, the Big 12 kind of battling. The ACC is kind of – there. they are what they are. They're not, I really don't see a lot of change there. Um, you could. There's been some talk about it, but I'm not as high on that. The Big 10 and the Big 12 are the two most likely – but the Pac-12 could lose somebody like Colorado if you paid enough. So let's see if Kansas is the big fish that I think it is because of the basketball program and they are able to get their thing going. If you lose Kansas, it really changes your basketball league for the Big 12. They've got a great basketball league. They were just won it. Kansas is always in the mix. Oklahoma State is always in the mix. Iowa State is constantly a top six seed in the tournament. There's a lot to look at. And even though they're losing Texas – that's a, that's a good basketball program. And Oklahoma is a good basketball program. Basketball league's still good. Like it or not, Kansas is still the top of that board. That really hurts the brand for hoops after you lose your two biggest in football with Oklahoma and Texas. So I'm Brian Smith. I am the publisher of inside the nights on fan nation with sports illustrated. And I appreciate everybody for listening. Make sure you go and check out all my other YouTube videos. I've got a lot of stuff coming up. In regards to UCF's fall camp, preseason predictions, going to be talking a little bit about the Boise State matchup, and certainly going to be talking a lot about recruiting. I live in Central Florida, going to have a lot of uh, Florida recruiting videos. I'll be in Georgia in October. It's, it's a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Have a safe and blessed day.